Greetings, ladies and merchants, and welcome to the latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called, What Do Humans Know of Space War Tactics? If you are enjoying these stories and have listened to multiple, please consider subscribing and liking. It helps the channel immensely. Anyways, more importantly, onto the story. It is written by Captain Keys123. General Naram Sin walked around the encampment that had swiftly gone from segregated by race into a huddled mass of what the humans called a few shattered divisions. They were dug in with hastily fabricated netting thrown over the heavy equipment and every soldier they could get stuffed under some sort of overhead covering. A day ago, Naren Sim would have scoffed at such a pedantic considerations. Now he knew better. He could see their old LZ making a smoking ruin in the distance. The Vroskel had bombed their ships from orbit after the Galactic Coalition ground forces retreated. Several of the human dropships and strategic transports were caught in a bombardment. Naren Sim had lost all of his big shuttles. There were a few ships from the other members of the Galactic Coalition, those small enough to maneuver rapidly, but not enough to evacuate all his troops. They were stuck. He walked past the pit being dug by several of his troops. One of the righteous Fury Maker was crouched down, preparing to move into a firing pit in what the humans called a hull down. What good is this going to do? One of the larger draconic soldiers demanded, We're just going to surrender tomorrow anyway. Naren Sim sighed and rubbed at his fringe. He tried to think of the strategic situation. The Galactic Coalition, despite their publicity info, didn't only use infantry. They also used mecha, better suited to zero-gravity environments, and could maneuver in urban terrain. They also were loath to affix them with heavy armor. It affected their agility attributes that did not help over vast semi-forested plains. He looked at the smoke in the distance again, then turned the corner around a few tents. What do we need food for a week for? He heard one of the coalition accent says. They've got the orbits, we're fucked. It's the general's orders. Just go with it. We'll be surrendering anyway. I guarantee it. Naramson turned in time to find two of the serpent folk, some of his orderlies, look up and shock at him. They looked at each other then quickly began to jabber away at each other about very important equipment. As he walked past, he could see into the tents. Exhausted and worn-out coalition soldiers filled the tents. Their weapons were uncleaned, and they lounged about in despair. The general didn't even know what to say to that. He knew they couldn't surrender, but looking at the troops, he didn't know what else he could do. Naramson star stood about the camp, trying to take account of all their surviving equipment. Did they have enough food to last? Would their batteries hold out? Did they have the right materials? These were all considerations his military hadn't normally considered. Engagements tended to be won or lost. There were no extensive campaigns like there were in ancient history. Parade ground tactics work fairly well in Space Station. Certainly, that's what the humans called O'Neill Cylinders, and could be arguably useful in shock and awe. That was his experience, and now the wars of old had gone, when you could pound the enemy's ground forces into scrap from orbit. What did it matter if you lost infantry or not? Ground forces like his were not the ancient scrappy warriors of the Great War. The naval battles were what truly mattered. As he walked, a helicopter buzzed in. The Terran aircraft were dedicated for the atmosphere, something he would have dismissed were it not for the wounded coalition being disgorged from the helicopter's many. Terran medics rushed to take the wounded to the triage center a few meters away, hidden under a collection of tents. Naram Sin looked at the helicopter liftoff. His case vac systems were all surfaced to space, far less useful tactically. The coalition expeditionary force wasn't prepared for an extended stay. As he watched, another helicopter came in, roaring in to deposit a new load of wounded. The combat support hospital they used was far more sophisticated than his own field hospital. Naramson's forces were expected to be able to send case vac shuttles to orbiting cruisers. Fighter jets, honest to goodness, air-breathing combat aircraft buzzed overhead. They looked like they had stealth services and large missiles, but that was it. Naramson could hear more jet engines in the distance. The planes didn't use proper runways. They could land anywhere that was flat. From what he'd seen, they had deployable air cushion landing systems that enabled them to take off and land from snow, swamp, 
dirt roads, and even lakes. There was one just over the nearby trees, and it means that they operate hidden from orbital surveillance, and our shuttles can't even move, Naramson thought angrily. He found his way to the remains of the mobile command center. It was a small chamber with a few consoles, and one particular chair for him. It was mostly empty. The console stark. One of his subordinates, Major Eshk, was inside. She stood up early. No, no, Naramson said. Take a seat. You've earned it. The officer, an avian race, sat down thankfully. Status. Things aren't going well upstairs, sir, the young major said miserably. The humans are helping tremendously, but there is too many of them. Seems the enemy had all the eggs covered, and they're curling in on us. Any word from the Gashi? asked the general. They're in complete panic. Seeing us withdraw doesn't give them any confidence. They're trying to conduct orderly evacuations, Eshk grimaced. But with the spaceport seized, there isn't much point, the avian paused. Sir, the humans are doing their best to help. They're conducting disaster relief. Yes, Naramson sighed. I gave them permission to use our troops as well, he grimaced. At least, that's something we know how to do. The avian tilted her head. Sir, I thought disaster relief is something we do on the regular, Major Eshk. Naramson sighed. Is there any update on our vehicles? The Major shook her head. Same as it was before, sir. How units don't have the legs for this, literally and figuratively. That's what I was afraid of, Naramson hissed. Damn it! He rubbed his fingers again. I thought we'd be maneuvering to a primary spaceport by now. He checked their displays. He could see through washes of static, unit trackers in orange to signify their own forces, fading to catch the rapidly mobile purple forces of the enemy. Black squares of the humans harassing the enemy, but they were so few compared to the enemy's total forces. This is synced to the human sensors. Sensors and field reports, the avian said. Their drones, surveillance flights, uh, the major rolled her eyes. Uh, scouts. Who uses scouts in ground combat anymore? Evidently we do now, Naramson sighed. Instruct our forces not to waste time pursuing enemy light units. They'll get caught out of position again. Their ground forces typically fought in space boarding actions, but landings were quite common. However, they rarely left major spaceports in the pirate engagements they'd fought. Mecha and infantry could maneuver better in those areas, and the distances involved weren't very far. Military planners for years had warned that even a few small armored vehicles could help with response time and a reduction in casualties, but were ignored. There had been numerous reports over the years of logistical snarls, with troops unable to get new batteries for their weapons or get heavy support due to the lack of armored personnel carriers or armored fighting vehicles. But it was claimed the logistical demands of the great wartime equipment was too much and unnecessary. Damn number crunches, Naren thought to himself. He thought he heard the roar of an engine. Two APCs came into the encampment. He stuck his head out of the small command center to see them unload a few stretchers. The forms inside of them were ill-fitted for the human lifters, but it served its purpose. He could see them wearing the uniform of Mecha Crew. I'd give anything for those museum land ships back home, the Major grunted. Uh, Naramson asked. The Great War and had vehicles like that. Ours are a bunch of buses. Yishk threw a gesture at some of their hover vehicles nearby. Out one of the windows, two were being serviced already short on support supplies. A human marine was busy trying to understand the manual. Oh, hey look, some of our soldiers who haven't fallen out of discipline. They served us well for many years, Naramson murmured. Eshk swore, General, they're incapable of defending themselves from the enemy. Their orders are to run and hide. At least the human jeeps can shoot back. One of the hydrogen-fueled vehicles roared past, as if to emphasize her statement. We've lost ground in a dozen sectors, because they couldn't get a resupply, and our mecha were too slow. Naramson's hand hit one of the consoles. I know, he snapped. He rubbed at his fringe. I know all that they said. He gave a sneer, a mocking tone. Why would we care what happens on a planet? Once the orbitals are taken, it's all over. He rolled his eyes and glared at Eshk. You think I don't realize that? Look at them, he gestured outside. Main battle tanks sat nestled in firing pits, like beetles preparing for a long winter. They don't seem ready to know that. They don't seem ready to roll over and die. Eshk stood up. They seem ready for a campaign, sir. I think we better learn from them. 
She looked at the harbor vehicles. One of the engineers just slumped over and gave up. And we better learn fast. Naramson saw the engineer begin to squabble with the other. He swore, I had better go consult with the General Thomas then and see what else we haven't learned. He stepped outside the command center. He noticed a few marines hover trucks off in the distance, more self-propelled guns. Great black barrels folded down on their backs, and the trucks sped off. They left the encampment in a cloud of dust. Naramson kicked himself mentally. Galactic Coalition! Perhaps I'd better try and coalate more. He found his way to the Terran Marine Command Center. It was more mobile than his was. It was built into a truck. A guard stood by and politely opened the door for him. Naramson was surprised to see the room's sophistication. There were consoles, officers chattering and giving out orders over the radio, and he could even feel air conditioning. He felt a touch of jealousy. His subordinates were nowhere near disorganized. Half of his were about to collapse, while these looked like they could keep going for a month. Tornik, the man who'd saved half his command, asked. He materialized at the general's side with a steaming mug. We brought some goodwill materials with us. Naramson looked at the cup and took it. Thank you, Colonel, he sipped it. It's not going good upstairs, Sellers said. I heard, Naramson grimaced. Normally, when confronted with such a situation as this, we'd be advised to surrender. What brilliant Terran strategy will save us this time? I presume General Thomas has a plan? Sellers gestured, and the pair moved to the smart conference table at the rear of the command center. Major General Thomas sat at the back, going through the screen's displays. The small woman didn't seem quite like the type to command a fierce military force, more like a librarian. With a slight build and a pair of wide lens glasses, General Naramson, she said, standing up, good to see you. Likewise, General, Naramson extended his hand to the smaller creature. I must thank you again for your assistance in saving us. Thomas shook his hand. I was wondering when you would get your head out your ass. She pushed her glasses up on her face. We're in a tight spot, and I'd appreciate it if you get your rock-headed staff too. She paused. Ah, crap. You don't have any of the rockheads on staff, do you? She looked at Sella. Hey, sell out. Do they have any? Uh, I don't know, General. Sella said sheepishly. Some good you are. Thomas rolled her eyes. Yes, ma'am. Not a librarian. Or perhaps too much of a librarian. Naronson didn't know whether to be offended or to fall in line in respect. The general appeared to speak in profanity to anyone she knew, yet as she glanced at Sella, he could see that he respected her, like she was his personal deity. No, though in their culture, that's something of a compliment. They'll tell those sludgeheads to get their anatomy to the point where they can actually pull a goddamn trigger. I've got a war on my hands, and it's not helped by your jackass brigade insisting on the right way to do things. My division has enough on its own plate without having to do your job and ours. Naronsim chuckled, then sucked air between his mandibles. Many of my staff are under the impression that we're already lost the battle, General. Some of them believe that now that the orbitals have been compromised, we are to surrender. Is that what you think we should do? Thomas asked. As we've seen today, my judgment is beyond worthless, Naronsim said miserably. Thomas frowned. General, you got shaken up, I get it. Just take a breath. And let's go over what we'll do next. What is there next? He demanded. My troops have lost their faith in me. Our weapons are worthless. And we've lost the orbitals. His hands were shaking. I can't command anything. I can't do this. Thomas' mouth shifted. Naren Sim, stop and take a breath. What for? <laughs> he laughed hysterically. So the troops can tear me apart. You're the boss. Tell them to cut that shit out, Thomas snapped. We're going to need everybody we can if we're going to make this off this planet. Off this planet? Thomas, we're doomed! He nearly dropped the tonic. We're doomed, do you hear me? The war is already lost. Thomas scowled. She walked up to him and pointed a finger at his chest. Hey, you see this on your shirt? He looked down. What? Her finger flicked up at the mandibles. Wake up, she snapped. I'd smack you if it wouldn't be considered assault. She glared at him and pointed a finger into his face. You are a general of the Galactic Coalition, so act like it. Naronson rubbed his mandibles. How dare you? Your pity party is over, General, she growled. Her slight mammal frame was so much smaller than his. But in this moment, she was like a giant. I don't have time for your bullshit. I can't win this battle alone, and neither can you. So, you got a bloody nose, big deal. Wipe that damn blood off, get whatever you call balls out of your mouth, and be the general your troops need. 
So, you got knocked out. Big deal. You get back up, you big, tough metal bird, dude. Sellers gently put a hand between the two. Uh, General. Naramson took a breath. How dare you expect me to... Uh, what do you expect me to... Thomas shook her head. She turned, walked away, and leaned back against the table. You're the general, goddammit. Now you have to do what you say. And if they refuse, don't let them, she snapped. You got beaten up, and it's on you to make sure that doesn't happen again. It happens to the best of us. But you can't fall apart like this. We've never fought war in... Thomas shook her head. Oh, cry me a river. We've been unprepared for wars all the goddamn time. Naramson scoffed. I hardly think our definitions of unprepared match. One of my ancestors was in a war where the army was so small, half of the officer's corps was able to defect. Thomas growled. Naramson blinked. Uh, what? We get unprepared all the time. Getting caught with your pants down is normal. She strode around the table. So what are you going to do about it? Cry? She started adjusting the hollows to the smart table. No. So what am I to do? Thomas looked up and glared at him. You're going to tell them that you were unprepared and you fucked up. Then you're going to be a the general. You've got the legal authority. Hell, you've got the moral authority. Kick their asses and tell them that you shape up. You're going to tell them what they need to hear. That you're going to keep fighting. And you'll win. You want me to lie to them? The fight isn't over till it's over, Metal Bird, Thomas said. The way she stood reminded him of an old propaganda posters. You have the authority, General, Sellers said hopefully. Remind them who they are. Naronson stroked his mandibles and saw Sellers' expression. That loyalty, that devotion to Thomas. The abuse could pass by because she'd earned his respect. He stood a little taller. All right, I'll tell them. And I'll earn their respect again, he took a breath. So, what's your plan then? Work with you to come up with a better one, Thomas grunted. No, I mean... If it's more whinging, I'm going to scream. How are you going to deal with the orbitals? He asked. Half the problem is my troops don't know what to do. Thomas gestured to the table. A hollow of the local area was on the display. Merrimson leaned over the table. To his surprise, the image of the jet fighters and the trucks he'd seen depart were on display. We've got surface-to-space munitions. I know you feckers don't have them. You idiots don't even have proper supply chains. Buzzers and alarms went off in the room behind them. They're preparing to fire now. Naramson peered at this place. How can you have the energy weapons with enough yield to hurt the enemy ship? It's not missiles. Those launch sites are too easy to... It's real guns, Sellers explained. Real guns and air-launched missiles. What? A voice said distantly, Firing! An animation of the truck's plate unfolding and firing the great black barrels. Naramson frowned. I don't understand. Real guns don't leave the kind of signature a rocket does, and a shell doesn't need to achieve orbit. It just needs to get there. Thomas said with satisfaction. She gestured. Now fighters are launching now too. As Naren Sim watched, the fighter jets boosted into supersonic zoom climbs, primitive aircraft, still using jet turbines and unable to leave the atmosphere without rocket boosters. And even then, only sub-orbit to be caught by a passing ship launched a dozen missiles straight up into the sky. They'll try shoot at us, but they'll have to dodge, Sellers said. We can shoot down troop transports they send at us and take pot shots at the big ships. It might not kill them, but it'll sure make them mad. They must want something here, Thomas said. All the surface batteries in the world wouldn't make the difference any more than conventional forces did back in the Cold War. But the ability to annihilate something doesn't mean a damn thing if we're not in a war of annihilation. And these idiots want this world alive and unspoiled. Naramson considered the implications. Orbital defense batteries mounted on the backs of a truck. Any human world with any sort of infrastructure could pose a threat to ships in orbit with these weapons. Wait. What did you say? Cold War? Was that your Great War? Seller and Thomas looked at each other. Excuse me? Seller asked. Was this how you fought in your Great War? Huh? Galactic standards are clear, Naronson said slowly. A final Great War or even two are fought when a civilization reaches the Industrial Age. Then they either annihilate themselves in the Atomic Era or make peace and reach for space. The humans were silent. I know not what weapons World War Three will be fought, but World War Four will be fought with sticks and stones, Sala murmured. 
Naramson heard the words, his mandibles fell open, and he took a step back. Thomas frowned and looked at Sellers. Great War, you don't suppose he means... Sellers scratched his head. Oh, shit. No wonder they haven't gone past Napoleon. They used to have tanks, though. Yeah, but if World War I was the only big war you fought, why would you make better tanks? World War I? Narimson echoed. He took another step back. He looked at the drink in his hand. He looked back at the room of dedicated soldiers behind him. He realized with horror that it wasn't that they were primitive. They had survived the final conflict and then fought several more. The sound of guns. End of story. I'd quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. Cold War Boomerwaffen, Severin Cerberus, Bushmaster 177, Henry the Red, Casper Arnholtz, Cold War Boomerwaffen, Elijah Silvercross, Dragzoon WRE, and Severin Cerberus. Thank you very much.